Okay, well, this is with Tom Long, Tommy Lee Long. That's and, right. And um, uh, I know you were born in 1945 uh, in Cartersville, but came to Ackworth in 52. And why don't you talk about what Ackworth was like uh, when you were growing up here in the 50s and early 60s? When we first moved back, we moved here to Ackworth in 52, uh, I guess my dad wanted to be closer to Marietta. He drove a uh, Greyhound bus back then. And mother, my mother's sister, Aline Poo, mm -hmm. who was married to Zoomer Poo, they lived in the Coates and Clark uh, uh, Mill Village. So we wanted to be closer to them as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, we moved back and rented a house on Rayburn Street here in Ackworth. And I couldn't, we tried to buy it. I guess my dad told me he tried to buy it back then, but they couldn't get a clear title to it. So we went over and he built a house at the corner of Main Street and New Street, which is right across from the Coates and Clark baseball field. So we built that. And uh, at that time, we were going to a church here called Shady Grove Church. And uh, it used to sit right across from the old days Chevrolet dealership. And now when you turn to go under the railroad crossing there at Ackworth, uh, there's where they put the Christmas tree every year during the Christmas time. That's where the church sat. So that's where uh, I gave my heart to the Lord back when I was 11 years old. And uh, back then got to starting to know everybody uh, here in Ackworth and uh, was baptized in Proctor Creek, which is here in Ackworth. And uh, my mother... She took a picture of me being baptized with a Noah Brownie Hawkeye camera. And uh, when, when I got in the music business years later, I said, if I ever do an album, I was going to use that pitch, picture. And I, I found it and was able to use that for an album that I did later on. But, <clears throat> but anyway, I went to Ackworth Elementary School. And uh, as a matter of fact, I brought a lot of my old report cards I've got from every year I was in school. And... Uh, Thank God for some of those teachers that uh, kept us straight, uh, like Fannie B. McClure and Miss Charlotte and uh -huh. Miss Hollinsworth and Miss Scoggins and uh, Mr. Crawford. Uh, who was the principal at that time? At, uh, that was T.C. Uh, Cantrell, I believe. And, uh, and there, Mr. Hayes came later, I believe. But uh, we lived in that house across from Coates and Clark uh, ball field there. Uh, until I was about 10 years old, and uh, 10 or 11, and my dad wanted to be out in the country. He thought he wanted to raise some chickens. So we bought Dan Chandler's old farm out on Third Army Road, which is uh, right before we, it comes into Cobb Parkway there. So we started raising chickens. We had 12,000 chickens we had to raise. And I guess, I think my dad wanted to teach me how to work. Thank God he did. So it had 25 acres and 12,000 chickens. And every morning before the school bus ran at 7 o'clock, my sister and I, Genevieve Hobgood's her name now, we had to feed 12,000 chickens by hand with a scoop. Get it in the bucket and feed them. And come back in, take a shower, and catch the school bus at 7 o'clock. And there was no dirt road that went down to the lake there. And Doug Biddy, who's an old friend of mine who graduated from high school with me, and his uh, brother Randall Biddy, who hauled chickens back then, we all used to work together and play together. But we did that for several years. And my dad, when we first moved there, he said, here's a, a pitchfork. It was about two and a half feet wide. He said, there's 20, 25 acres of chicken manure scattered in piles on this land out here. I want you to scatter it every year, every afternoon when you get home from school. You take that fork and you go up there and start scattering that chicken manure. And he says, when you get that done, he said, I may give you an allowance so you can buy a guitar. So I always wanted a guitar to play, and my dad played guitar. So I finally got all that done, and he ordered me a, an old silver tone from Sears and Roebuck. So then he said, well, you're going to have to learn to catch chickens because uh, these chickens go off every eight weeks. So there's a guy here in town named Lum Meadows. And, of course, Jerry Austin and Joe Austin and some of those guys, uh, Jerry Bearden, and we'd all get together, and uh, Jack Weeks from Kennesaw, and we'd catch chickens. They usually uh, do that from about 1 o'clock in the morning to 4 o'clock in the morning. And uh, if you carried the chickens, you got about $6. And if you uh, caught the chickens, ate at one time, you might get $8. So that's the way I made my extra money. 
And then... Uh, tell, my, tell me about your father. Uh, yeah, he was, it looks like he was working full-time, but he was also a minister. How did that work? Well, he was a lay minister from uh, uh, what we call a foot-washing Baptist church. Okay. And uh, after he stopped uh, driving the Greyhound, he got a job at Lockheed. Yeah, he was a precision welder. So uh, he would go to work at Lockheed, come back, and then we'd, he'd help raise the chickens. And every eight weeks, we'd have to clean out that chicken house which was a very hard work. And uh, we stockpiled that and sold it to different people for their lawns, for fertilizer and that sort of thing. And uh, he'd give me part of the profit from that. But uh, he, was, he was called to preach when I was about 11 years old. Uh, he said he ran from it for a long time. And then uh, he, he made his announcement, I think, at Shady Grove Church there in Ackworth where we went. Of course, we didn't have any air conditioning or anything like that back then, so he drug my sister and I to a lot of revivals around North Georgia. we go to singing uh, meetings where they'd bake coconut cakes and coffee and they'd teach shape note singing, mm -hmm. which was a, a form for the Southern Gospel people to use back then. I guess that was really a really fabulous experience for somebody going into the music industry. It was. My dad taught me three chords on that guitar that we got from Sears and Roebuck, a G, C, and a D. And he t showed me one song, and I'd go out on the doorstep, and I'd play that song, that one little song with those three chords until my fingers would bleed, mm -hmm. until I learned how to make those three chords really quick. And I went on from there and, uh, and studied myself. Later on in Vietnam in 67, uh, I learned a lot of the bar chords when I was over there. But, uh, but yeah, we, we lived. In Vietnam, you learned the bar chords? Yeah, I did from another guy that was uh, played a lot better guitar than me in Vietnam, and he was sleeping in the same tent as I was. and So uh, he taught me the bar chords wow. when I was over there. But, but we lived on that chicken farm uh, several years. We had my... Aunt Aileen and Uncle Zoomer to move in. We had a little guest house next door. So they moved in to help us raise chickens one year. And we lost money. That's the only year we ever lost money is when they helped us for some reason. But uh, it was just a down, down year that year. But after that, uh, my dad swapped that farm to the Presleys, which is Sandra Presley's family. Sandra is married to Tommy Jones. So we moved to their house on Dixie Avenue in Ackworth, which is right down the street from uh, the old Ackworth Elementary School, which is, I guess, the McCall School now. But our neighbor was T.C. Cantrell. Okay. He was our next door neighbor. And uh, his sons, Billy and Tommy, and I would play basketball in the afternoons. He had a little basketball court there. And then across the street from him was the Keenels, who I guess Keenels owned Unique Knitting Mill. And then next to them was Frank Callahan. And I think Frank's dad was the uh, postmaster general here. Mm -hmm. So Frank played the saxophone, his son. So he'd get with me on the doorstep, and I'd play guitar, and he'd blow his saxophone. So that's where I lived when I graduated from uh, North Cobb High School. Yeah. Well, uh, a couple of years between high school and Vietnam, what were you doing then? Well, Lockheed. Okay. I graduated in 63 from... Uh, from North Cobb, uh, didn't think about going to college. All I thought about was going to work because my dad said, if you get your job at Lockheed, you can't beat that. Mm -hmm. So I went to work at Lockheed in uh, September of 63 for $2.10 an hour. And I understand you were a pretty good football player. I'm surprised there weren't any scholarships. Well, you know, I didn't even think about that. Nobody pushed me to that direction. I was pretty good. Uh, Coach Matthews, uh, my senior year, gave me the most outstanding lineman trophy. Robert Golden uh, was our quarterback, and uh, he got a trophy as well. And we won the midget championship in 58 when we played together. And, mm -hmm. and all the write-ups and all the papers, it was called the Golden Long Touchdowns. And uh, so he'd always throw me the pass. I'd catch him and make the touchdowns. And that's the way we did it in high school, too. And he and Emory Sewell were – Great coaches, I love them to death. And uh, but no one ever really talked to me about getting a scholarship or going to college. And all they talked about, my dad did, said, "Well, you need to get you a job and go to work." So you went to Lockheed for two dollars and something. Two ten an hour. Two ten. 
Worked. This was not bad back then, was it? No, it wasn't too bad. That's how I got my first new car. I bought me a 1964 Dodge Polaro Hemi 383. <laughs> but uh, before that, though, I had a, a 55 Chevrolet. When we lived on Dixie Avenue behind uh, T.C. Cantrell, I bought a 55 Chevrolet from Jack Dempsey, Jackie Dempsey. He had, they had a garage here, and Jackie still, I think, works on cars still here. But uh, he wanted $900 for it, and I couldn't get $900. So my dad went up to the Ackworth Bank and went on a note for me to get $900. So it had uh, black lacquer paint. It had rolled and pleated interior. It had a 383, no, 327 Corvette engine in it. And, uh, and I was proud of that thing until one night I was drag racing uh, GTO here in Ackworth, tore the rear end out. And that Saturday morning, uh, Harold Blassingame, who graduated from high school with us, he knocked on my door and he says, I understand you tore the rear end out of that 55 Chevrolet. And I said, yeah, I sure did. He said, would you take $700 for it? I said, do you have $700? He pulled out seven $100 bills and he said, yeah, I do. I said, okay, let me have it. So I sold it that and I went and bought this 64 Dodge Polaro. And that's uh, the one I beat a GTO in because it was a push button back then. You know, it just had push buttons on the side. And uh, but that was a great car until I totaled it. But it was good uh, the whole time I was in the service. I had it. But uh, but uh, yeah, I was a good football player. I was uh, I led the county in punting uh, my senior year. I was averaging about forty yards a punt, forty five yards a punt. And uh, but it was some good times playing football. And I ran track and played basketball as well for North Cobb. Were you a sprinter or what did you run in track? Well, I did the broad jump. Okay. I won third place in the uh, broad jump statewide in 62. Okay. And, uh, but I did run the 440 relay mm-hmm. and the 440, which killed me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, other than that, and, and you know, I got a granddaughter now who's just won the state championship this year in the pole vault. Is that right? Yeah, she goes to Altoona. She's a senior. Uh-huh. She's getting a scholarship offer from all over the country right now. Her name is Courtney Long. It's my son's uh, daughter. Uh-huh. But, yeah, she just had the uh, University of Tennessee has been after her. I think there's a coach at the University of Tennessee uh, who won the uh, gold medal in the pole vault. Uh-huh. And he's been after her to come up there, and he says if she'll come, he'll help her maybe go to the Olympics. Wow. Well, I ran track at the University of Tennessee back in the oh, early you did? 60s. Oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah I was a uh, middle distance runner. Well, back then we didn't have a weight room or anything like that. We just no, nobody did. No, we had to do it on our own. Sort of like Herschel Walker, you know. Herschel yeah. he never lifted weights. He just did push ups and sit ups, and uh-huh. but his body was well deformed, yeah. uh, not deformed. Yeah. In, <laughs> well formed. Well formed. That's correct. Right. So did you get drafted for Vietnam? Yes, I was. Uh, I was going to night school at the George, University of Georgia Extension, which was out at the old Southern Tech uh-huh. campus. I was going to night school, I was taking three subjects, and I dropped one. And after I dropped one, I got a draft notice. I was, uh, when I found out about it, uh, I was having to buck rivets in the tail of a C-141 at Lockheed, and I was getting really tired of bucking rivets, laying on my back with a bucking bar, and, a, and I thought, well, you know, I think I'll just take this draft notice, go and do what I can. And it was in 66, in June, and you could have gotten a deferment because of your job at Lockheed? I doubt it. And I didn't really want one. I, I felt like I needed to serve my country. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I went ahead and got drafted uh, in 66. They sent me to Fort Bend in Georgia. And it was really hot that summer. We went through basic training. It got up to 115 a couple of days when we were on rifle range. They'd make us dip our fatigues in barrels of water and put them back on. I never will forget laying there in all that sand and trying to shoot a an M14 at a target. and uh, But then uh, we, we did two weeks out in the woods trying to prepare to go to Vietnam. And uh, it was like zero degrees. And I, I said, well, Vietnam's hot. I said, we're out here and it's zero, <laughs> freezing to death. But, <laughs> but then uh, after basic, I got put in a 200th assault support helicopter company. It was a Chinook outfit. And they made me the uh, primary electrician for all those 33 Boeing Bertal Chinooks. I didn't know any theory whatsoever. All I knew how to do was splice wires because the first job at Lockheed I had 
was stamping numbers on wires and rerouting wires into C-130s. And that's what I was doing the day the intercom came on and says, President John F. Kennedy has just been assassinated. Five minutes of silence. So the whole plant in the B-1 building shut down, and we sat there for about five minutes, everybody praying with their heads down wow. when he got assassinated. So you were working there while you were in high school? No, I was right out of high school. I graduated in 63, oh, September. Right. He got, he got, he got assassinated in November of 63. Sorry. That's right. So I was working there then, and then uh, I got my draft notice in 66. I uh, went to Fort Benning, and from Fort Benning, went to a helicopter outfit. We flew 33 Boeing Fertile Chinooks all the way to Alameda, California. And I went on the, those choppers flying out there. And then we preserved them, put them on an old aircraft carrier called the Kula Guff. And they made me get on the Kula Guff with those Chinooks and go all the way across the ocean to Vung Tau Harbor in Vietnam. It took us 28 days nonstop. We averaged about 19 knots. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget going through the Philippine Islands, the most beautiful sunset I'd ever seen going through the Philippine Islands. But when we pulled into Vung Tau Harbor, all I could hear was boom, boom, boom. And everybody was scared to death is what we're getting into, you know. But we sat there for a week putting the blades back on those Chinooks, and then we flew them off the, the aircraft carrier into the jungle where we were stationed in a place called Bearcat. Hmm. So you spent a year in Vietnam? I spent a year in Vietnam, and one thing that really helped me in Vietnam was, uh, of course, I worked on helicopters. Uh, when they'd shoot them down, we'd sling load them back in, and I'd fix the wiring and do whatever we had to do to keep them back in the air. But I was playing guitar and singing in my tent one night, and this colonel heard me, and he says, you guys sound pretty good. And uh, he said, would you like to go play some different places in Vietnam? And I said, well, that sounds like a neat idea. He said, well, I got my own private Ace Model Huey. He said, uh, if you want to, I'll fly you some different places on the weekend so I can get out of here too and we can, we can uh, maybe have a little fun. So he, a guy named Larry Peters from uh, Kansas City, Missouri played with me. So we would fly to, to Sock Train and do the EM clubs, officers clubs. We'd fly to Vung Tau and do the officers clubs and EM clubs there and just get out of the jungle for the weekend. So that uh, it really helped me a lot uh, as far as honing my guitar playing. So, so you came back and went back to work for Lockheed? I did. Came back in 68. Uh, got married to uh, a lady named Diane Howard, who was the daughter of J.R. Howard here in Ackworth, and had uh, my son and daughter by her. Went to back to work there at Lockheed uh, in 68. Uh, we stayed married uh, five years and was divorced. And, uh, and then uh, I was playing in a band at night, going to night, going to night school at Georgia State University. Mm -hmm. I would study to one and two in the morning, get up at six, catch a ride to Lockheed at seven, clock in, drive to Georgia State. Uh, it was three days a week I would drive my car, but I'd drive down to Georgia State after work and go to night school, get out about 11 at night, drive back home, study. Didn't leave much time for family, right? It did, and that's one of the problems, you know. It, uh, a lot of that was my fault because uh, I was doing so many other things. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but anyway, it didn't work out. So uh, later on, uh, I met Belinda, who I'm married to now. We've been married 40, uh, be almost 42 years. Wow. Met her in Daytona Beach, Florida. Yeah, I was uh, Danny. I don't know Danny Wilbur, who's uh, he lived in Kennesaw. He went to went to North Cobb too, but he was a Marine in Vietnam, and uh, he was exposed to a lot more Agent Orange than I was. Mm. So we didn't know it at the time when we went to Daytona just to get away uh, one summer that he was dying at that time from pancreatic cancer. Oh my goodness! So we You're about twenty years old. Well, he was twenty. Five or twenty-six, somewhere around there. But oh anyway, we uh, we were driving down the strip there one day, one night, and saw a sign that says, "Appearing tonight, Johnny Carver, tie a yellow ribbon around the old oak tree." He had that out. I told Danny, I said, "Well, we need to go see him." So uh, we went that night, and uh, Belinda, my wife, was there with her roommate, and uh, we struck up a conversation and started dating. And 
later on she moved to, to Georgia and we got married and she was in the medical field. She worked for a cardiologist. Mm -hmm. So we were married in 76 and then uh, in 1981, after I was working for Bill Lowry, we moved to uh, Nashville to go to work for Tree Publishing, which was a, uh, the biggest country music publisher in the world. Before we get into that, uh, you were talking about going to school at Georgia State, but you told me earlier, Kennesaw yeah. Junior College. What years were? Well, when I came back from uh, Vietnam, I started going to night school at Kennesaw uh -huh. State, which was a junior college. Right. Wasn't very many people going there at the time, uh -huh. but it was close to home. So I'd drive over there at night and go to classes and uh, and enjoyed it. At uh, 71, I graduated. I got my associate degree. And then uh, I transferred all my credits from Kennesaw down to Georgia State because uh, I had some folks that I knew that went to Georgia State and they said it was a good school, especially if you wanted a degree in management. Mm -hmm. So in 73, I've got a, a four-year undergraduate uh, degree in management, mm -hmm. business management. And then uh, later on, I went back and got another degree in commercial music, copyright law, uh, mm -hmm. publishing. Mm -hmm. Uh, in 77, I graduated again from Kennesaw, for Georgia State. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so you're still working at Lockheed, though, until 81? To 72. I got laid off in 72. Oh, in 72 is when you got laid off. I got laid off. Well, that was a, a, a bad time for Lockheed around 72. Well, I'd been there right at nine years seniority-wise. Uh -huh. And that uh, C-5A Model 1 blew up. Uh -huh. Lockheed lost her contract. And that's when I was actually a supervisor then over paint operations on the horizontal stabilizer for the C5A. I had several quality assurance people that worked for me. And uh, it got down to about 8,000. It went from 33,000 employees to 8,000 employees. Yeah. So they got, got me too after the 8,000. And I says, well, maybe this is a blessing because I wanted, always wanted to do music somehow, some way. And I said, maybe this is what the Lord intended to happen. So mm -hmm. that's when I went back and got a degree in commercial music later on. I did various jobs. Mm -hmm. I worked for Butch Thompson, Butch Thompson Enterprises, yeah. uh, working in sewer lines. And because mm -hmm. Butch and I went to school together, and I knew Butch really well. And I had he jobs. Was county commission. He was. And as a matter of fact, uh, I've talked to Butch quite a bit. He and I are on a committee right now trying to get Larry Nelson a big statue, a bronze statue made of Larry Nelson to be placed at Cobblestone Golf Course. But, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, I did various jobs. I had a job, the worst job I ever had in between that time was operating a jackhammer in a, a manhole trying to run telephone lines through these holes. Mm -hmm. It was a 90-pound jackhammer wow. this way. I did that. Uh, I did a siding work for construction. Uh, because I knew uh, quite a bit about carpentry work. Mm -hmm. So I had different jobs doing carpentry work, trying to make money. Uh, but You're when. Not using that management degree, it doesn't sound like. Well, it didn't until I got in music publishing. Right, okay. But, Kenneth, but after I went to Georgia State, I got an internship. And that's really what sparked it. Mm -hmm. they, uh, I put my name on an internship list. So they gave me an internship job uh, at Master Sound Studios on Spring Street in Atlanta. It was owned by Bob and Babs Richardson at the time, who were associates with Bill Lowry. And uh, after I got that internship job there, I started doing uh, setting up their publishing company and doing. They had one hit in their catalog called uh, "By the Swinging Medallions," called "Double Shot of My Baby's Love." And, but they had recorded the, the theme song in there for uh, Deliverance. Uh, different people came in and recorded. Isaac Hayes and I became real good friends because he he'd come in there and record and write songs. And James Brown would come in there, and I got to know James. And as a matter of fact, I found a letter one night that James left in the studio. I, the next morning, I was cleaning up, and I found this letter he had written to Senator Herman Talmadge about his tax situation. So uh, I, I kept that copy that he left laying there, and I still got it. I got it with me tonight, today. But uh, it's the most funniest letter. It's about three pages long. He's talking about how all these people had duped him and his taxes and all, but he was a neat, neat guy. But uh, anyway, that, that led me to go to work for Bill Lowry. Uh -huh. 
and I worked for Bill for uh, about three years, and and Bill was the publisher in the South. I don't know if you know who Bill Lowry is, but Bill, uh, he came from Louisiana and started WQXI Radio in Atlanta. And uh, he got cancer, and he was in the hospital with cancer. And the Smith brothers, who had a TV show on WAGA, Channel 5 in Atlanta, and they used to have Brenda Lee come in and sit on a, stand up on a cracker barrel and sing. Well, they came over to see him one day, and they said, uh, Bill, I said, you know all these people through radio. Why don't you start your own publishing company and, and own these songs that people are, are singing? And... Uh, and that way you can have your own insurance and uh, if you get through this cancer and build yourself a career instead of just doing this DJ thing you're doing. So he started the Lowry Music Group. Well, one of the first writers he found and signed was uh, Jerry Reed. He signed Ray Stevens. He signed Tommy Rowe. He signed Billy Joe Royal. He started working with Buddy Bowie, who they formed the Atlanta Rhythm Section because Atlanta Rhythm Section were doing all the demos for them. And he started developing this big catalog. And then he had Young Love. He, he published Young Love, which was huge for Sonny James. So he built this big catalog up early on and, uh, and became the publisher. Because everybody thought he was crazy trying to do that in Atlanta. Everybody thought he should move to Nashville or New York or Los Angeles. But he said, no, I love Atlanta. I'm going to stay here. And uh, after I went to work for Master Sound Studios, I became the vice president of NARIS, which is the National Academy of Recording Arts and Sciences, which is the Grammy Awards. It's the Atlanta chapter. And through that organization, I got to know Bill real well. And uh, he offered me a job, and I went to work for him. So, so how did you get to Nashville? When did, uh, 81 to, to Nashville. Uh, why, why the move there? Well, it's uh, in 78. Zell Miller, he wanted to start the Georgian Music Hall of Fame. And I got to know Zell from working with Bob and Babs Richardson at Master Sound Studios. So he, he appointed me to be on his commission, his committee, to start this thing. And that same year, I started and co-founded the Atlanta Songwriters Association. We always thought there was a need for an association of songwriters to come together and uh, and and get to know each other and help each other write songs. So we started that in 78 as well. And I would take songwriters to Nashville to do showcases. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'd take, Joe South would go with us up there. And you know, Joe had many, many hits like Games People Play, Walk a Mile in My Shoe, Down in the Boondocks, all those big hits. We'd go up there and uh, do showcases. Well, when I did that, I got to know uh, Francis Preston, who was the head of BMI, Broadcast Music Incorporated in, in Nashville. And I got to know Buddy Killen, who played bass for Hank Williams Sr. and also was the co-owner of Tree Publishing in Nashville. And through that, uh, th I got to know those guys. And then Bill would give me Joe South songbooks and I would go door to door in Nashville handing out Joe South songbooks. And then Bill was the president of the Country Music Association at that particular time. So he wrote letters to all the dignitaries in Nashville about me saying, hey, have an open door for Tommy or Tom Long when he comes up there and to give you a Joseph songbook. So I got to know a lot of folks that way. Well, through that, I got a call one day from Buddy Killen. And Buddy says, Tom, would you be interested in moving to Nashville? and going to work for me. I said, well, I don't know, buddy. I said, I love Bill. Bill's been really good to me. He only pays me $75 a week, but he pays for all my expenses when I go to different places. He'd send me to Los Angeles to pitch songs. And uh, I'd go to New York, and I'd go to, uh, one week out of every month, I was in Nashville pitching songs for him. And doing that, the, only, the first song I got cut was an old Jerry Reed song called Misery Loves Company. Porter Wagner had had a hit with it in 64. We re-demoed it from 4-4 time to put it in 6-8 time. And I took that new demo to Nashville and I played it for Rob Galbraith, who worked for Ronnie Millsap. He loved it, cut it on Ronnie Millsap and went straight to number one. So the first song I ever pitched went to number one for Ronnie Millsap. So through that, Buddy said, okay, come up here and just talk to me. I said, okay. So I drove up and met with Buddy. 
in his office at Tree Publishing. He says, uh, what would it take for you to come to work for me? I said, uh, $300 a week? He said, well, if you had asked for five, I'd give it to you. <laughs> I said, okay. He said, what's it going to take for you to move up here? I said, well, probably about $1,700 to move. He said, okay. And he stroked me out a check for $1,700. So we came back, sold our house on Crawford Circle over here off Canton Highway, loaded up the U-Haul at trucks, said our goodbyes, drove to Nashville, and uh, moved into a place called Smyrna, Tennessee. And we lived there for three years until we decided that the drive was too long, 30 miles one way for three years, so we, we moved into Nashville. But big auto company in Smyrna now. Yeah, Nissan. Yeah, our, actually our house was right down the street from the Nissan plant. Mm -hmm. But in those three years, it was very crucial for me, working for, for uh, Buddy Killen. Because in 80, 83, we moved there in 81, and in 83, I became the president of the, the Nashville Songwriters Association. And uh, as a matter of fact, they're having their 50th anniversary of that next Wednesday at the Ryman, and they wanted me to be there for that because I was president in 83. But through that, I made a lot of speeches. And through the uh, Nashville Songwriters Hall of Fame events, all the award ceremonies that they did, we had a TV show going at that time where I presented an award to Ray Stevens. And, and through that, Hal David was the president of ASCAP at that time. Hal David wrote many, many, many hits for all the pop artists like Dionne Warwick and What's New Pussycat and all those big hits back in. And uh, to all the girls I've loved before, Willie Nelson and uh, Julio Iglesias. But anyway, he saw me do several speeches, and he came up to me one night and he said, uh, what would you think about coming to work for ASCAP? And, uh, which is American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers. And I said, well, that's, a, that's an interesting thought. I said, let me talk to uh, my people I work with at Tree. So Roger Sovine was my boss at, on the, in the creative department at Tree. He's uh, Red Sovine's son. Red Sovine was a big country artist back in the day. I said, what do you think about me going to work for ASCAP? He said, well, I think that'd be a good move for you. Then I asked how, I said, how David, I said, why do you want me to come to work for ASCAP? He said, well, Connie Bradley, who's the head now, Jerry Bradley's wife, Owen Bradley's son, Owen Bradley started Music Row. He produced Patsy Cline and all those, Brenda Lee and all these people. He said, I want you to be groomed to take over the head of ASCAP when Connie leaves. I think she's going to leave in about two or three years. And I said, well, under those circumstances, I think I might do that. So I went to work for ASCAP. Well, Connie got a whole breath of fresh air, stayed for 10 years. So during those 10 years I was there, uh, I signed about 800 different songwriters to ASCAP. My job was to be out in all the clubs at night mm -hmm. trying to find talent, trying to find songwriters. And back then, people smoked in all the clubs. I would come home at night and have to leave all my clothes on the back doorstep before I went in the house because it stunk so bad. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was a great 10 years. I got to know a lot of people, a lot of pictures made. And uh, during my last year there, I got an intern from a kid from Belmont College. His name was Brad Paisley. He worked for me. And uh, I had a guitar, which my book's about. It's called This Guitar Can Talk. It's an old FG-180 Yamaha that I bought when I got back from Vietnam. And uh, I started letting people sign it with with a pen scratched into the grain. And the first person to ever sign it was Isaac Hayes. So from that point on, I started getting people to sign it. And uh, it was sitting on my guitar stand in my office, and Brad was in my office one morning. And uh, I said, Brad, I said, do you write, do you play guitar? He said, yeah. I said, do you write songs? And he said, yeah. I said, do you sing? He said, yeah. I picked up my guitar, I walked over and I put it in his hand and I said, play me something. He said, that's not what I'm here for, Tom. He said, I'm here to learn performing rights. He said, that's part of my job, I mean, my thing I'm doing for Belmont College. I said, I don't care what you're doing for Belmont College, I want you to play me something. I shut the door, I locked it. I said, play me something. So he played me a song and said, wow. I said, play me something else. So he played me another song. So I got on the phone, I called my, the staff that I work for, and I said, y'all got to get down here and hear this kid. 
So they all came down and sat around. He played them another song. And then after they all left, he said, you want to see my scrapbook? I said, you got a scrapbook? And he said, yeah. So the next day he brought his scrapbook in from Wheeling, West Virginia. He was already in the Wheeling, West Virginia Hall of Fame. He had opened for all these big acts in, in West Virginia where he's from. Mm -hmm. And I said, this is amazing. So I started letting him write with some writers that I was working with. And uh, I said, I got a job for you. I said, I, I'm getting ready to leave ASCAP to go to work for Ann Murray. Ann Murray has wants me to come to work for her to run her company here in Nashville. I said, but I want you to do this for me, if you will. Take a magnifying glass, go over my whole guitar, and find all the names and put them in alphabetical order and put them in a computer for me. So it took him three days. So he did that for me and typed them up. And I said, Brad, I said, one of these days you're going to be have a record deal. You're going to be a big star. I said, I don't know when it's going to happen, but you're going to be a big star one day. I said, I think you got a halo over your head. He said, okay. I said, but when you have your first number one party, I'm going to come to that party, and you're going to sign this guitar, and you're going to be the last one to ever sign it. He said, really? I said, yeah. So that happened. So that's in my book. I got a picture of him signing my guitar at his first number one party. And I got him to sign a document that stated that he took all those names off of my guitar, and, and uh, then he signed my book, too. And uh, then he did a book called Diary of a Player, and I actually brought a copy of it. But he, on page 150 in that book, he talks about how he worked for me at ASCAP and how I exposed his music to Music Row when he was in Belmont College. How about that? And then I went to work for Ann Murray after that and uh, was running her publishing company. And I got a call one day from a friend of mine who worked for Reba McIntyre. He says, Tom, there's a guy that just sang a demo for me over here. He's pretty good. He needs a job. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, you think you could help him out? And I said, well, send him over here. Let me talk to him. So he come walking in. He sat down. He had a big, tall boy, had a cowboy hat on, long hair. I said, where are you from? He said, Ada, Oklahoma. I said, uh, you need a job? He said, yeah. I said, can you make CD copies? Yeah. What's your name? Blake Shelton. Blake Shelton. Okay, he looked, he's in an old pickup truck. He drove right out of high school. When he graduated, drove to Nashville. So I gave him a job for $8 an hour. So he worked for me for about four months. And uh, But I had a song that I had on a cassette tape. And I said, well, Blake, I said, uh, looks like you just want to be an artist, don't you? I said, because he was messing up big time. He was making uh, CD copies for me, but he was putting the wrong songs on the CDs. <laughs> And I'd go play them for a producer or an artist. Mm. And I said, uh, man, I, said, I think you need to go and pursue your career as an artist. Uh, I said, but here's a song that I own part of that you probably should record if you ever get a deal. He said, okay. So I gave him a cassette. There's a song called Old Red. I don't know if you know that song or not. Uh, do you know who the you know song? Mm -hmm. it, was, it was his signature song. He said, Come on, somebody, why don't you run? Old oh, Red's itching, have a little fun. Get my lantern, get my gun. Red, a heavy treat before the morning come. Now there's red haired blue ticks all in the south. Love got me in here and love got me out. It's about a guy that kills his, his uh, wife's lover and he gets put in prison in, on the Florida Georgia line. And it's about an old dog that slept in to, that he trains and. He gets him out. It's, it's a neat song. But anyway, he, he worked for me, got a record deal and uh, on Giant Records, and Giant Records folded, and then Warner Brothers picked him up, and the rest is history. He's gone on now and made millions and millions of dollars. And He's a big hunter. He used to come out to my farm and hunt turkeys and deer, and he and his first wife, Kaynette. But he, uh, $8 an hour to, uh, I think he makes 15 a year for The Voice, 15 million. <laughs> Wow. Anyway, that's just one of the stories of many that I've got, but uh, that's yeah. two of the, the ones I'm proud of. Yeah. Well, then you come back to uh, Cobb County in, what, 2011? 2010. Yeah, I had, uh, Ann Murray sold her company uh, right as 2000 was hitting. And uh, she was tired of, of doing what she was doing in Nashville, and uh, she saw the, 
the handwriting on the wall that she's probably going to retire pretty soon. And she'd been a great boss. And she was a she actually flew me out to play golf with her in golf tournaments. We uh, she right before I left, uh, she flew my wife and I up to uh, Prince Edward Island in Nova Scotia. And she's from Nova Scotia. She's from Spring Hill, Nova Scotia. And we played in a golf tournament up there with uh, John Daly and Mark O'Meara and uh, Fred Couples and Mike Weir. And because she was a celebrity and she just needed a partner and I was her partner. And uh, so we had a lot of fun doing that. But she sold the company to a, a, a Canadian company called Chorus Music. And uh, so I lost my job. And But Donna Hilly, who was the president of Sony ATV at the time, Sony bought Tree Publishing where I first started out. And it had the Michael Jackson catalog and it also had all the Beatles songs. So she wanted me to come back there and go to work for her to manage the Lowry catalog. She had bought the Bill Lowry catalog. And I said, wow, I didn't know that, where I started out. So she bought the catalog. She wanted me to come back and manage the catalog for her. So I did. I went back over there, and it lasted for five years. And uh, during all that process, I said, well, we need to do some master recordings of, uh, of your songs on other artists so we'll own the master as well as the copyright. Well, I had discovered the Kentucky Headhunters years ago, and I got them their record deal on Polygram. And they're all good friends of mine, and so I did a some uh, I did a record on the Kentucky Headhunters while I was there. I did a uh, we did a record on Brenda Lee. I did one on Pat Boone. I did a gospel record on Pat Boone. I flew him in from California and did that while I was at Tree for five years. And then Donna, who brought me back to Sony, got sick, very sick. So she had to step down as the president, and when that happened, uh, I lost my gig there. And so I started my own company called Artist and Repertoire LLC with a friend of mine, and uh, what we did was publishing. We did uh, production work in the studios, recording artists. That lasted, I was into the fifth year, and my dad died. And uh, Horace Long, Horace M. Long, and uh, he had... Uh, cancer of the kidneys and they had to take one of his kidneys out and mm. then uh, he acquired uh, E. coli while he was in the hospital 2009 and he passed away and my mother didn't want to move back to uh, move to uh, Nashville she wanted me to move back here and look after her so we made that decision I gave up my company I had there and uh, we moved back July July the 20th of 2010 we moved our furniture. I actually bought her house, and we moved in. It was 100 degrees that day. Mm. So, and uh, the next night, we went to Butch Thompson's house for a big celebration for high Ackworth uh, graduates, or North Cobb graduates, and had a big dinner, and uh, that was kind of a welcome home event for, for me and my wife. And But uh, but anyway, it's uh, we've been here now seven years, a little over seven years. But uh, Are you still... Uh involved with the music industry at all since you came back? I am, to a certain degree. I do uh, some administration for uh, a couple of my friends uh, that I've worked with over the years. One's Alaska's Hobo Jim. He's, he's in Alaska. He's written uh, the theme song for the Diderod Sled Race that they do every year on ESPN. I do administration work for his catalog of music. And there's a cowgirl out of Canby, Oregon. Her name is Joni Harms. She was a staff writer for me when I worked for Ann. Uh -huh. And I do a work for her. And I just got a young kid out of Clayton, Georgia. I discovered him uh, through a CD that was mailed to me. I got it out of my mailbox one day and was listening to it uh, two years ago. And I really liked this kid. He was only 20. And I called him and went up to visit with him. He is his mom, he and his mom in, uh, up in Clayton. And I asked him, I said, he was writing all these songs by himself, doing all the demos in his bedroom. He had a little setup in his bedroom doing all these demos and was playing all the instruments. Mm -hmm. I said, do you work? He said, yeah, I work for the road department here in Clayton. I patch potholes. I said, really? And he said, yeah. I said, you ever think about going to Nashville? He said, well, I thought about it. He said, I don't know anybody up there. I said, well, let me, let me set some meetings up. Let's go up there. So I set a few meetings up. We went up first trip, had several meetings with publishers, and nothing ever came from it. Six months went by. I called him again. I said, you ready to go back to Nashville? You want to go again? I said, well, let's go. You, you know, can't give up. 
So I took him back up there, and the last meeting we had was with Brad Paisley's publishing company, Seagale Music. A friend of mine, Chris Dubois, who's the son of Tim Dubois, who was running Air Astral Records in Nashville, who signed Alan Jackson and uh, Brooks and Dunn. And uh, so we met for about an hour, an hour and a half, and his name is Jeb Gibson out of Clayton, J-E-B Gibson, G-I-P-S-O-N. Good kid, good, I mean, he's got a great family. And uh, so it went pretty well, I thought. One Saturday, a few weeks later, I was at my grandson's baseball game, and my phone rang. And it was Chris Dubois. And uh, Chris said, Tom said, that kid you brought up here, he said, uh, I want to sign him to a deal. I said, you do? And he said, artist publishing development deal. I said, okay. So we went back up there. He signed a deal with him, and uh, then he moved to Nashville. He's been up there now a year and a half, I guess, living in Nashville. And as a matter of fact, he's in the studio this week recording his record. They're doing a record on him this week. And uh, he's, I'm really proud of him. He's, he's actually going to the 50th anniversary NSAI event next Wednesday with me. So. Fantastic. But uh, he's the latest one I've been able to help. Well, um, one of the things we wanted to talk about is, um, is Ackworth and uh, values of living in a small town and maybe a little bit about how Ackworth has changed since you were growing up. Wow. Well, traffic. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, Ackworth has really boomed. I'm really proud of uh, the mayor here and what he's done because uh, I learned to swim at the Ackworth Beach when I was seven years old. My dad was still driving a Greyhound back then, and he would bring me, when he got home, he'd bring me down here and taught me how to swim. Back then we had the old, uh, well, not a raft, but whatever we call it out there in the middle, we'd swim out to, and he taught me to swim there. And, and another thing, we used to have these uh, Hugh Baby Hopperoonies at the Ackworth Beach which music-wise was a thrill to me. I don't know if you know who who, who Hugh Jarrett is. Hugh Jarrett was a bass singer for the Jordanaires who backed Elvis on the Ed Sullivan show when Elvis was on the Ed Sullivan. But Hugh was from Gainesville, and he worked for WPLO radio station here in Atlanta. And he started a thing called Big Hugh Baby's Hopperoonie. Well, they'd set a wooden stage up on the Ackworth Beach. He would invite all these artists to come in and play and we'd go and dance on the beach. He'd charge a fee to get in, and we'd go down there and dance, and we did this for a few years. He would have like Tommy Rowe and the Romans, and Mac Davis and the Zots, uh, Sam the Sham and the Pharaohs would come in and play, Travis Womack would come in and play, uh, Billy Joe Royal would come in and play. Actually, I think he had the Four Seasons one year that come in and play. Such a great time back then. It was in like 1960, 61. So this is in the beach house? That... No, it was on the beach. On the beach itself? Yeah, on the sand. Yeah, and it set the stage up out there and set up a sound system. And, uh, but, you know, that, that was exciting times. And uh, just the community that we had here, people working together and playing together and riding their bicycles. And, and on Saturdays when we lived across from uh, Coates and Clark baseball field, there, my next door name is, neighbor was named Johnny Haney. And he and I would ride our bicycles up here to the Legion and watch a cowboy movie. And he'd eat a uh, hot dog at that trolley that sat next door. And then if we needed ice, we'd go across the street to Barry Rextel's father who had an ice house over here. And, uh, and we got to know each other and played ball together. And it, the values were so great. You, know, you didn't have to lock your cars or lock your doors. Uh, if you needed help from someone, all you had to do was call them. It was a great time to live back then. And I think the kids today are missing out on a lot of that. They're so all on their phones all the time looking, looking down instead of communicating with people and like we had to do. And I had to work, too. Dr. Lacey, he would have me come over to his house and clean his house. For, you know, 50 cents an hour, I would take... Uh, furniture polish and a, and a cloth. I'd go in there and clean all of his furniture. One year he wanted his whole yard resawed. I went in and, and resawed all of his grass. And I had a lawnmower. I had saved up $800 when I was uh, 11 years old cutting grass, different people. Uh, back then, kids knew how to work. Uh, today, to get them to carry the garbage out is a, is a big deal, you know? For a lot of them, I'm sure a lot of them are not that way, but but just the values and uh, 
the honesty that we learned and hard work and and in the pool room, you know, my I love the pool room. My dad ran me out of it a few times, but we had a guy named Rabbit who ran the pool room up here on the corner. And sometimes I'd slip slip in there and play pool, and that's where I learned how to play pool. And and then uh, Eddie Jones, who owns the tire company down there now, he had a pool room too. And on Saturdays I'd come up. That's when Larry Nelson and Mac Turner and a lot of us would play pool together. But, uh, yeah, those were fun times back then. So, well, you said ahead of time why you wore your shirt today, but we didn't have it on, uh, we, on, the, on the film, so yeah, I had a, why you got your shirt. I had another shirt laid out I was going to wear this morning, and uh, I got to thinking about all the people in Florida right now, what they're going through, and this hurricane that really devastated uh, Miami and Jacksonville and some other places and the Keys. And I, I've got a real good friend of mine who's, he lives in Texas, but he owns a home in the Marathon, Key West. And uh, I was thinking about him this morning and a lot of the things that's going on there. And I decided, well, maybe I'll put this shirt on as remembering those folks down there this morning. Well, I think I'm about out of questions or anything that we should have talked about that we haven't. Well, I like a lot of stories about music, but, uh, you know, we can, that's another time, another place, I guess. But Ackworth... I've, I love what's going on here. I love how they've redeveloped the main street here because I, I remember when Allen's 5 and 10 used to be here where Henry's restaurant is now. In my 1964 Dodge Polara, I had American mags on it, and I'd love to pull up to that traffic light, the only traffic light we had back then, and look at my mags in the plate glass windows at Allen's 5 and 9 store. <laughs> I love doing that. And uh, that's some great times, and uh, but just riding around on Sundays in our cars, and you know we didn't get into any trouble, but we had a lot of fun. But uh, I, I loved how the Ackworth Beach has developed down there, and and I was proud to put my name too down there on the the Veterans Memorial at the beach. Yeah, I've got a brick down there with my name on it, with uh, 200th Assault Support Helicopter Company, of Vietnam, and and Larry Nelson's got one there as well, and some other folks, but I'm glad they developed that, and I think that's really, really neat for our city. And I think a lot of people are moving here because of the lake. I mean, it's such a great place to kayak and fish, and and uh, I noticed that Tommy Jones, who came to pick scuppernines at my house yesterday, you know, his dad owned 200 acres over there. I think he owned 100 of acres where that Ackworth Lake is, and he sold it to Ackworth, so they could actually build that lake, and now he owned part of the property where Cobblestone is now too, which I think is one of the probably the top-ranked public golf course in the state of Georgia. It's right here in Ackworth. Okay. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much. I've, I've enjoyed listening to your stories today. Well, thank you, Dr. Scott. I appreciate you having me. Thank you, Mr. Long. All right.